So EMC uh, is a technology company and uh, it also has a consulting arm. I've been with EMC since 99. I've, I've had uh, several roles within the organization with my most recent role being responsible for the nearshore and offshore component of the, uh, of the consulting business. Now EMC and iQuest have a long history together. Uh, we worked in several engagements and uh, today hopefully I'll be meeting with iQuest uh, uh, stakeholders to discuss future business as well. So we have a long history going back together, very successful model. And uh, again, I would like to thank very much iQuest and you for giving me the opportunity to go through how EMC realized its own cloud vision. Now, um, many of the companies start the cl their cloud vision with what we call uh, virtualization. Say, it's an exciting topic, um, usually misunderstood, and uh, usually starts with virtualization. So what we do is, uh, first of all, the business is relatively conservative about virtualization. They like their own service. And the IT organization within the, within the company actually starts with uh, virtualizing their own service. So this is the first phase, essentially about uh, the, the infrastructure is virtualized, about 20% of the service uh, are virtualized, and <clears throat> this is how we get to start what cloud is about. Then we start, as we gain maturity on the cloud uh, technologies, we start uh, consolidating the uh, mission critical applications, we see the uh, the applications move to the virtualized environment, what we call the business production, the applications being moved into virtualization. Then uh, finally, where we want to go today is uh, not just virtualization, which everybody can do more or less, not just uh, implementing some virtual technologies, but actually do the transformation and run IT as a service, run IT as a business function. And what this means is that through the help of standardization and the automation, uh, we enable IT to become, a, to become a business function, add business value, just rather than being some, some guys out on the server room. So when you look at it, uh, many of us might actually uh, re remember that in many organizations, it takes about two months from the idea to actually the server being on the shop floor. And what we want to do is reduce the, this to less than a day to have a server up and running. So how we do that? The, the IT as a service, as a concept, uh, is based on really three pillars. Agility, control, and cost savings. Now cost saving is, is clear. Um, the, the organizations are more and more on, on uh, cost uh, challenges. They need to do more with less money, or they need to do more with the same budget. Everybody is expected the same money, so there's really not much on that. The other one is uh, the agility. Now, I want to give you a little anecdote around this. Now, probably you've seen that at, uh, there are public cloud companies like Amazon, Amazon Web Services, Google, where they provide compute as a service, where you can access compute services across the internet. Now, one of the customers is a large um, pharmaceutical company, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, pharmaceutical. They are really IT driven. Uh, they, uh, they do their drug research on high performance computers and they require a lot of storage, which is good for EMC, and uh, compute, uh, compute capability. Now, think about it. Uh, drug uh, research is very competitive business. So you don't have time and uh, everybody's looking for the same drug at the same time. And if you're first to the market, you're going to make the millions. And if you're second to the market, all you're going to be is a generic drug producer. Now, if, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the companies uh, on the R&D department, it, it took almost three months for a server to be, um, a server to be uh, provisioned. So the business unit, they went to Amazon Web Services and they used Amazon Web Services within a day to provision the same amount of CPU capacity. Now, this is a business threat. Obviously, there are uh, risk and security issues with that, but you cannot hide, you know, you cannot dug your head into the sand and say, oh, no, you can't do this. Oh, no, you can't go to Amazon. What you need to do as an IT organization is to be able to compete with them, is to be able to provide 
similar services. So that's the first thing. The other thing is control. Now, uh, virtualization is not new. Virtualization has been around almost like 2004, 2005 with VMware ESX technologies. And uh, when I was based in UK <coughs> back, back in the day, uh, the, there was a bank which had approximately 1,500 Windows servers. So we did a virtualization project for them. They were one of the early adopters, 2004, 2005. Now, uh, out of 1,500, 1,500 physical servers, we've done, we achieved close to 60, 70 percent uh, virtualization, which is all good. Uh, two, the, two years later, we went back to control their virtual machine sprawl. What I mean by that is that within two years, out of 1,500, 1,500 physical servers, they increased to 3,500 virtual machines. And they said, how did we get here? So you need to be able to control that. Technology is easy, but the processes and the people behind this is even more important, are more important. They, uh, the other thing that is important is that we hear about the uh, clouds, the public clouds, the, uh, like Google, like Amazon. We hear about the private clouds, that the clouds that you establish uh, within the organization. The most important thing is that uh, as running, running for, to run IT as a service, it's important to establish best practices. It's important to establish uh, standards within the organization. There are two important uh, points that we need to take into consideration. The first one is service management. Now, everybody can virtualize. There is not much of an issue there. It's a technical concept. But virtualization is not going to bring business value, add business value, unless you are able to manage IT as a service. What I mean by that, I will open up a little bit. Um, but it's important that you have the people and the processes that go with it, go with the technology. The other important point is trust. Now, many organizations, uh, while we are people in the end, and we sometimes, you know, some of our are really into technology, you know, ex-geeks or still geeks, current geeks, they like their Android phones, they like, you know, we like our iPhones, iPads and everything, and uh, we, we use our own money uh, pay for the iPhone, pay for the iPad, and want to use it for business. We want to access our uh, business application, we want to access our own business email. Now, you cannot say no. You, know, you cannot just uh, say, oh no, we don't do this, use only that technology, we don't let you do this, because you cannot you know, stand in front of innovation. Okay. People innovate, there are new technologies, there are new ways of doing work at the same time. Uh, you may remember from the previous presentation, uh, there are there will, oh, more than one billion people who are working mobile. So what you have to do as an organization is to embrace, support, but make sure that there is a security element to it as well. It's important that, especially with mobile devices, security is something that needs to be in place. And uh, the other thing is that you cannot have security on a device basis. So you have to have your security, policies, procedures, and technologies in place, and cover not only the standard applications like Oracle, Microsoft technologies, and so on and so forth, but also make sure that you are ready for the new end user computing as well. So computing on the go, mobile devices on the go, and make sure that the security is in place. So security and service management are two important pillars before you move on to your um, cloud journey. Now, uh, how we do it? Now, I'm, I've been with EMC Consulting since 2004, with EMC since 1999. Uh, I've been around for a while. And uh, so what we do is uh, we start with looking at the applications. Now, we start looking at what actually can go into cloud and what cannot. So it's first, we start into uh, analyzing the application infrastructure. Then uh, we look at the target services that are meaningful for the business. Now, I'm going to open, up, open this up uh, a little bit more, but, uh, you know, the business doesn't care if you uh, put your, uh, I don't know, Active Directory into cloud or, um, you know, some backend services into cloud or your storage management. It needs to make business sense as well. So it needs to add some certain business value. The other one is, again, it's important that the orchestration and the automation is in place. 
Because if you don't do that, if you treat virtual server just like another server, then you're actually going to have limited benefit from the cloud technologies. So it's important that you maintain a holistic view of what you're doing on the cloud. So how we do that? Uh, we first start with uh, looking at the applications, look at an application uh, rationalization. Uh, it might be retiring the application. Now what happens is that uh, somebody has written an application on, uh, I don't know, and some like uh, novel netware and he's left the company 10 years ago and uh, nobody has any documentation on the application. Nobody knows what the how to set up the application once again. But it serves a critical purpose. But it's not really used uh, a lot anymore as well. So you look at, you know, should I retire the application? You know, is there a function that can do something similar. And things like Lotus Notes. You know, IBM is going to pull support out of Lotus Notes. Uh, and you can look into whether just keep your Lotus Notes data there. You can look into migrate Lotus Notes to Microsoft Technologies Exchange for uh, email. Or migrate from Lotus Notes to SharePoint. So you can look at retiring the application. You can look at uh, migrating the application. You can let, look at replatforming. Now, you might be aware that there was a, uh, some sort of a dispute going on between um, Oracle and HP. Uh, Oracle decided that Oracle will no longer support the database on uh, HP UX platform. And, uh, and Unix is, is, is expensive, is, has become expensive. Solaris, it used to be everywhere. Now, uh, there's nothing wrong with Solaris, but people notice that, you know what? You can do it with Solaris, you can do it with Linux as well. And you can do it with cheaper. We're on cheaper hardware, with cheaper support. Linux has matured. So people are looking into how can I get away from this Oracle HP dispute, although they made up last month. Uh, how can I get away from this dispute? So how we do that? We, uh, we first look at the economics of moving to the cloud. Now everybody starts focusing from the technology. You know, let's take a step back. You know, we're all here to, uh, to make money, to take money home and uh, pay our mortgages and feed our families. And everything is about money and we're in business. So it's important that whatever we're trying to do makes sense for the business. So the economical viability comes first. Does it make sense to move to public cloud? You know, should I uh, use a public cloud. Could a public cloud uh, offering be cheaper? That's what we look at. We, we look at, should I keep it in-house from an economical perspective because I've already made investment in such and such technology. And then we look at the trust side of things. Is it okay for me to move my data over the public network? Do I have security concerns? Will those security concerns uh, addressed properly, or should I rather keep in-house, even though public uh, cloud technologies are uh, supportive of this fact. So once we do the economic evaluation and see we don't have or we have uh, trust issues for public clouds, then we we'll, then we look at the functional assessments. Okay, we said okay we can move that service to the public cloud. Let's say email, you know, which comes to mind uh, quite often. Uh, can suitable public cloud offerings like Office 365, like uh, Gmail or a hosting provider, can they, will they be able to give me the same level of service? If they do, then we move to public cloud. So make sure that the, one of the critical things about business is that the core competence. You know, we need to focus on what makes our company unique. We need to focus on uh, what makes our company different from the competitors, and we need to focus on that. You know, e an email system is a support function, or maybe it's a critical function. If it's a support function, just uh, leave, leave to the people who knows how to manage e email system best, and you focus on your core competence. The more focused you stay, the better uh, market share you will get in the end. It's important, and it's all business in the end. Yes, it is technology, but it's all for the sake of the business. Then, uh, once we move into a cloud model, uh, 
we look into the um, service catalog, service catalog from an IT perspective. So things like you know, bronze, silver, gold, platinum. A platinum server has four CPUs, eight gigabytes data. A bronze server has a half a gigabyte data. Uh, you can look at, I, I'm going to provide five nines availability, I'm going to provide three nines availability, I'm going to provide disaster recovery. It's important that the, uh, the infrastructure investment, the IT investment made into such applications are in line with the importance of that application. Now if your uh, kitchen is using, if your company kitchen is using an application to print out menus, it's obviously not a mission critical application. But sometimes we find all applications running on 5.9 infrastructure, 5.9's availability infrastructure. So it's important that the applications are given investments in line with their business value. So we can look at, this is what we do for IT, this is what we do for business, and it's important that we automate, automate, automate. Now what I mean by automate is that there's a lot of mundane system administration tasks, and the more we automate these system administration tasks, the more we have time doing tasks which have business value. And uh, once we have the tools and the process and the automation in place, then we can provide service levels. Don't forget, we're running IT as a service. We are competing with Amazon. We, as the internal IT organization, we are competing with Amazon. We're competing with Google. Okay? Amazon is after my work. Amazon is after my job. Google is after my job. So what I'm going to do, is I should be able to compete with them at that level. You cannot, you, know, you cannot stand in front of innovation and hope that it will go away and uh, I'm not going to lose my job to Google or I'm not going to lose my job to Amazon. It might happen. So it's important that I provide as good service as, as them and uh, as internal, or if I need to go to external services like a hosting provider, then uh, I leverage from them. I am clearly aware of which services I'm going to uh, provide internally and which services I'm going to provide through um, hosting providers. The, uh, we as EMC Consulting, uh, we did a project at one of the uh, credit card firms, global credit, there are actually three, uh, so one of the three, American company, and uh, it took them uh, it took them two months to provision a server. Now, business is fast moving. and Everybody you know, who played with VMware knows that you, know, you can set up a server in less than a day if you have the images. Now, in one end, you have these uh, technology companies coming and saying, you can set up a server in less than a day. And then the business is being told it takes them two months to have their server. Okay? So the business asking, what is going on here? You know, technology is somewhere, you know, you as the IT organization is somewhere else. I can go to Amazon and get my server in less than a day. Why can't you? Okay. So this comp this, uh, the IT organization came to us. So what we did is uh, we helped them build a vBlock-based architecture from the VCE, uh, Alliance Compute and uh, Storage and everything in one box. Um, you can look it up on the, on the vBlock if you're not familiar with the technology. It's storage, compute, and network all in, all in one box running uh, VMware. And uh, we, moved, we built the cloud for them. We moved uh, some of their applications to the cloud. And uh, we also helped them automate the platform. So when the business wants a server, they choose a server type uh, from their service catalog. They click a few boxes. Uh, they press some keys. And then, presto, they have their server from two months to less than a day. And this is what the business wants. And then when you achieve this, then you're like a wizard. I mean, you, you are unbelievable and it's so good and, and everything. This is what the business wants from us. This is what the business wants. You know, they hear about all these Googles and Amazons and things like that. And they say, I'm paying you a lot of money. You ask a few million dollars on IT budget. Why can't you? Why still have to wait two months? And this is what we help them. Now, uh, so just to wrap it up, how the cloud comes together. Um, first, we look at the business case. Does it make sense to move to the cloud? Okay, from technically, yes, we want to get our hands on virtualization technologies, on cloud technologies, but does it make sense from a business-wise?
Can I move my existing investment into a cloud environment? What, what are my operational costs? What are my capital expenditure costs? Uh, what would my operational expenditure costs look like? Uh, how much capital expenditure can I save? So you built the business case, and then uh, you look at the um, workloads. What can I move? You know, email, uh, SharePoint, uh, collaboration, uh, ERP. I mean, you, you can even move your mission critical applications to the cloud or use cloud service providers, you know, companies like salesforce.com, which provide Salesforce automation over the cloud. So you can look at, should I do this uh, with the traditional technologies? Should I do this with my private cloud? Or should I do this with my, uh, by going to, going to vendors? And then look at readiness. Now, it's important that you know, we don't look at this as just as a technology. You know, we, our mindsets need to be switched on to IT as a service as well. The people need to be ready. I'm going to explain this a little bit more uh, in detail uh, further on. Uh, the processes need to be ready. We need to have the automation tools in place. Just make sure that we as an organization ready as well. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to have a steep curve, virtualization curve. We're going to uh, virtualize a number of servers. And then we're going to plateau at some stage. We will have a lot of virtualization, virtualized servers still being treated like physical service. And finally, roadmap. You know, we cannot boil the ocean, so we need to have a plan. We need to do it one step at a time, and we need to start with the things that makes most business sense. Now, uh, it's all good and fine. Now, one of the things about consultants is that they come, talk, tell you, you need to do this and that, and then they run away uh, before you actually uh, start, find the opportunity of doing it yourself. Now, uh, we as EMC Consulting, we actually did a project for EMC's own IT organization. So EMC IT organization was one of EMC Consulting's biggest customers uh, recently. So what we did, you know, it's easy for a technology com company to come and say, do this and do this and do that, and not do it themselves. So it's almost like uh, before us, EMC Consulting, telling customers what to do, you know, we kind of, there's an expression, we ate our own dog food. Yeah, we first tried ourselves. Okay, now, uh, EMC, let's, let's take a look at EMC's own IT organization. Now, EMC is a big company. It's a 40,000 employees, now for, and uh, operates globally, um, $60 billion company. You would expect, you know, it has a big IT organization on itself. You know, five uh, data centers, Back in 2004, uh, we were uh, 24,000 uh, people uh, with 70,000 customers and uh, 400 applications and so on and so forth. And uh, we transformed from the classical IT organization to IT as a service across eight years, through a span of eight years. In the meanwhile, we grow from a storage perspective, we grew uh, almost like 11 fold, uh, 12 fold. Uh, our server count grew uh, more than three times. Uh, and uh, we are, from 100,000 people, we're almost uh, supporting 500,000 people, together with uh, internal EMC people, people in EMC-owned companies, as well as partners and networks. So we are supporting, and the IT budget hasn't changed. Okay. The same people, the same budget is managing five times the people, uh, supporting five times the people, and uh, three times the size of the environment. So how we did it, how EMC did uh, itself. Now we first obviously started with the development, test and development server applications because virtualization was new, or we don't know whether it could be virtualized, or we don't know it's going to work, or what about performance, or I'm not sure whether I want to share my service. You know all these questions back in the day. Okay, so we started with the, uh, our own test and development and IT, IT owned applications like system administration, like monitoring applications. Once we had the know how back in 2004, 2008, we uh, started with virtualizing mission critical applications. And by the time we were finished with virtualizing the uh, mission critical applications, we were almost 70% there. So 70% of the old server estate in EMC IT was uh, were virtualized. Now we are 
86%, almost 90% here, uh, of all the servers in the environment are virtualized. Uh, we provide IT as a service. There's a service catalog, uh, which we internally call uh, Cloud9. So you can log on to a portal. You know, if you, you enter your cost center information, you enter who you are, why you need the server, how long you need it for. Um, you still answer a lot of questions. It's not like you press a button and presto, you have a server half an hour later. You still answer a lot of questions. But then again, if you need a server, uh, very briefly, to do something, whatever you know, the business purpose might be, uh, as long as you have a justification, you have your server, it's all recorded, and then you don't have to worry about it. You know, it's been backed up and everything. So all you have to do is just go to the portal and ask for your server. So that's where we are now. Now, uh, it's all easy. Uh, you press a button and then a server happens, but it took EMC several years. Uh, to go through this journey, and EMC is a small company. So what we do is that we change our IT mindset, the IT team mindset. Now, IT is no longer a cost center uh, in the sense that uh, they take the money and then they do their own stuff, you know, a bunch of geeks behind the glass doors, but it's, it is a, a business function. Okay, it's a, it serves a business value. It's a, it interacts with... Uh, the business value. Uh, EMC IT was almost like a monopoly. You know, you know the bad thing about monopoly is that you, know, they, you tend to be lazy because the customer has to come to you, you don't have to provide good levels of service, and you can charge whatever you want, and nobody cares. Until you know, competition comes. When the competition comes, like Amazon, like Google, it just blows it away. And then you then have to become a market-driven, you know, can I do it as good as Google? Can I do it as good as, as Amazon? Uh, it's looking at, does it make sense? Why do I have to give you five nines? You know, tell me. Uh, this is going to cost you money. And then when you ask business, who's going to pay for this? Then they say, oh, they, you know, they take a step back. I say, okay, yeah, well, you know, I need to think about it. Otherwise, the business comes to you and say, oh, I want the biggest server you have. You know, if, if you are already in a data center environment, you probably know that uh, in the old days, the business would come. I say, I want the biggest server you have, and I want uh, five terabytes of storage. And then you start the installation, he, he uses less than 20% of the capacity. You ask him, why did you ask for five terabytes? Why, why, why did you pay for five terabytes? And he or she would come and say, oh, you know, I might need five terabytes in three years. So it's all waste of money, uh, in coordination, and so on and so forth. But the profit and loss changes the uh, rules of engagement. We use enabling technologies like uh, public cloud, private cloud, uh, some of the, for example, we use public cloud uh, for some of our business functions. And EMC no longer maintains uh, uh, some of the business uh, applications in-house. We actually use public clouds for the same level of service, or even better. And then, most importantly, now everybody knows technology, but I really want to touch on the, the mindset, the change in the mindset, the new roles, the new responsibilities that come with the cloud technologies. Because it's all about people. It's all about processes. Technology changes. It's important that you, you embrace innovation, you embrace change, do something about it, and ride the wave rather than uh, drown underneath it. So uh, this is EMC's new data center in uh, Durham, uh, North Carolina. It's 100% uh, virtualized. It's probably one of the world's first uh, cloud data centers. It's, it uses uh, cloud automation end-to-end. -end. Uh, we have Hopkinton is where EMC uh, global headquarters is. So we have active-active configuration. Uh, it's a nice concept, active-active configuration, but it's so elusive uh, to achieve. Uh, but we achieved active active configuration between our two data centers. Uh, it is standardized on uh, one technology, on one platform. Uh, we, uh, we run EMC's mission crit critical applications here, so it's not just a test data center or a showcase data center, but it's EMC's heart beats at Durham Cloud Data Center together with Hopkinton. And we have uh, zero data loss business continuity. You know, there are 600 miles between uh, Durham and Hopkinton, and we have zero data loss business continuity achieved in our tests. So, um, 
how did we get there? It's obviously, it's all about people. Now, the traditionally, uh, you know, we have DBAs, we have uh, system administrators, we have a help desk, uh, we have uh, capacity planning, configuration management, so on and so forth, functions. We have uh, uh, platform uh, teams who look at the underlying platform which enables cloud. We have uh, foundation teams which look at the basics, the bits and the bolts of cloud. And uh, we have the uh, system architects which are operating across the stack, which is a little bit different, but we still have our uh, IT service operations and service desk functions as well. So we have uh, new job descriptions. Now, how did we do that? Now, it's a, as I said, it's a change in mindset as well. And uh, IT is ever-changing. When I joined EMC in 99, uh, since I joined EMC in 99, I have had seven different roles in the organization. So it's always a constant readjustment to the market requirements. It's a constant readjustment to what the customers need and where the, uh, where the industry is going. So some of you might be actually working at customer data centers. Some of you might be actually working on the service provider or the technology provider um, end. Now, uh, one thing that doesn't change is the change and the, uh, the change which innovation brings. So, uh, now it's, it's not my you know, role to tell you what to do with your careers. Obviously, we are all working uh, for our own careers and what we do, what is best for us. But one piece of uh, thought that comes to, comes to my mind is that uh, please do not think that the roles we know today will exist tomorrow. Okay? The, the system administrators, they wanted to be senior system administrators. The senior system administrators, they wanted to be principal system administrators. The DBAs and so on and so forth. Now, uh, back in 99, 2000, um, or slightly before that, Novel Netware was all the hype. Okay? If you knew Novel, then Novel Netware, then you could command uh, high salaries and you can say, oh, I'm an expert on Novel. Nobody cares about Novel today. And uh, what you know, what you're an expert today, may not be relevant tomorrow. So it's important that uh, we embrace the change and uh, work on it. So what we have is uh, the cloud architects, the cloud administrators, the cloud architects, and uh, data center architects within the EMC organization, EMC's own IT. Uh, of course, um, people, have to embrace change, have to accept the change innovation brings, but also people do not like the fact that, you know, they have several years of experience on, I don't know, one particular technology, on Solaris or HPX and so on and so forth. They've been senior, they, they are well respected by their peers, and uh, you cannot just say, okay, you're no longer a system administrator, but now uh, you have to start uh, learning about being a cloud administrator. Okay, people are a bit hesitant about that change. So what we do is that we rotate people in the teams. So we say, you know what? Uh, you know uh, operating systems very well. You know you're an Unix expert today. And what we want to do is we want to give you the storage skills. Okay, once uh, you're finished with your rotation, once you become a cloud architect, you're actually um, you will have something important on your CV. So we, we want you to stay with an EMC, obviously. So we are investing in you so that you stay in EMC and enjoy your career. But also, you know what? If you align with this, then you actually will keep maintaining uh, skills which are in demand with the market. So what the market demands. So we have this positive thought around you're good at one thing, we want to teach you something else. Okay, you know, this is something new for you, but as a result, you will be expert in two, three different technologies. So we do this rotation uh, as much as we can. So it opens up huge opportunities for the individual, for the market, but also what EMC gains is that EMC gains uh, experts in multiple technologies, not just one, you know, in multiple technologies. And people talk, you know, it's how it is important for, uh, for you to have a network within the company. You know, sometimes you can't do everything, 
on an email. Sometimes you know, you just go out, have a beer, and then the business problem you couldn't solve on emails and meetings and everything is, all, is usually solved over a cup of coffee. It's usually solved over a, you know, over a glass of beer. So it's important to know people sometimes in the team. And this rotation gives us this opportunity as well. So we bridge, you know, we bridge the silos. Uh, you know, I'm, or I'm a system administrator, I don't talk to DBAs, we break these uh, silos and uh, we create incentives to be multi-skilled in, uh, in multiple ways. So it's important, uh, please do not think that the, the jobs you are in today is the jobs you will find five years on, ten years on. Uh, out of the seven roles I have assumed in EMC, three of them no longer exist. EMC, do, does not have those, EMC does not have those roles, EMC does not need those roles. You know, I've changed with the company, and uh, also please make sure that you also keep an eye on where the innovation is taking you, where the market is taking you, and keep your skills up to date accordingly. So, um, a lot of things. Um, the building the cloud infrastructure, we're good in technology, but not, let's not forget the people and the process side of things. Autom it's important to standardize, automate, and simplify. You know, make sure that anything that is repetitive can be done by automation, so you focus on things that require thinking. You focus on things that actually adds business value. Uh, you embrace a service mindset, which means that you, know, you are competing uh, you are providing a service to the business. You know, the, service, the, the business uh, is not obligated to pay your salary. The business is not, not obligated to uh, leverage from you. You have to assume a service mindset as well. So it's not just, oh, the business doesn't understand me. You also need to think, you know, what can I do to understand the business I'm in? How can I add value? Where are my skills put into perspective? It's important to invest in the people. Training is important, obviously and uh, also giving a career path. It's the transformation of the IT organization. That is key from a cost center to a business function, achieving that transformation, and running IT as a business function. Once you achieve that, you achieve IT as a service, and that will give you uh, the agility that you will need. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, probably it wasn't my place to give you career advice, but here I go again. Uh, important things to take away is not just technology, the people, the process, and running IT as a business function rather than a call center. So thank you very much once again. If you have any questions, happen to take them. Thank you. Um, so the first question, if you help me understand, the uh, interface between the cloud Yes. Um, exactly what kind of interoperability issues um, does it come to your mind? Take into account the fact that you will have you know, 100 applications in, in one uh, organization. Yes. Somehow they have, they have to work together. That's right. At least one big opportunity that's all this uh, usage of, of the cloud. That's right. So um, what we do is um, we maintain a business workload. On the, uh, we'll, we'll come to your second question, but let, let me try to answer your first question. Um, we look at what we call a workload. And uh, workload is um, actually an application or a set of applications uh, which provide a particular business function. So, uh, and as part of the cloud advisory service, which I didn't go into detail, is uh, what we do is um, an application dependency mapping. An application dependency mapping is, is a four-week activity as part of this um, service where we look at how applications talk to each other. So EMC is a technology called, uh, VMware is a technology called application dependency mapping. And uh, based on these application dependency mapping, what we call we build what we call a bundle. Now a bundle is a set of applications that work together. That's the technical term. And we look at these bundles, and sometimes these bundles work together and uh, become a workload, 
and we assess whether these applications can actually technically uh, go into cloud. So the, that, is the, uh, that is the interoperability. And uh, obviously, not all applications can go immediately into cloud. So then you, be, you have a question as to what am I going to do with this application? You can say, I'm going to retire this application because for me, going into the cloud adds more value than uh, keeping this application on whatever it is running on, like you know, an obsolete technology. Or you can say, I'm going to do something with the technology so that this application is going to run in the cloud. So it might be either migrating the application to cloud. If it is running, say, a well-known technology, then you can just take the, take the workload, take the application into cloud. Or say, um, this application is running an Oracle on Solaris or running an Oracle on HPUX or whatever it is. And you say, you know what, I've standardized on VMware. I'm going to migrate this application, uh, re-platform this application to x86, whatever, whatever it is. Or you might say, I've actually invested so much in this uh, technology that it doesn't make business sense for me to move to the cloud. But when it comes to wrapping everything up, uh, no, it is not easy to, you know, you can't just move to cloud because you decided to move to cloud. There's a lot of complexities, I appreciate that. And these complexities, we deal with it one step at a time. You know, uh, we look at the dependencies. We look at whether the dependency is a critical dependency or whether it is a dependency that can be broken. Um, if the technology is already supporting the cloud, if not, what I do with the application. And uh, it's important that we start with the economics. Because if it makes business sense to move an application to the cloud, then you invest in the technology to make it happen. Uh, and if you have the technology, but if it doesn't make sense economically, business value, then you don't move to the cloud. But there's a lot of uh, effort going on behind the, uh, the dependency analysis, the application criteria, uh, replatforming, migration, uh, retiring. And uh, all in all, it took EMC eight years to come to here. And I'm not expecting, you know, you take your entire cloud journey in 30 minutes. Uh, it takes a bit more than that. Obviously, you're, you're absolutely right there. So the second question was on, uh, you said the, there was interoperability. And the second question, can you remind me again? Uh, well, with regards to analytics, uh, I don't know if you heard about Greenplum. Uh, EMC is, uh, is into big data, and uh, Greenplum is one of the analytics technology which um, EMC is uh, investing heavily in. Now, uh, EMC is focused on three pillars from a services perspective. Trust, which um, RSA is, is a key component there, security. Uh, big data, which is um, analytics where EMC is a company called uh, Greenplum, and uh, we're investing into that, and, uh, and cloud. Now, uh, what we do is that uh, we see uh, the, the market is actually, in EMEA, the market is actually maturing with regards to moving away from data warehouse to business intelligence to uh, big data and analytics. So, uh, now, data warehouse, and uh, uh, business intelligence are backward-looking uh, concepts. Now, when I say backward-looking, I'm not saying in a bad sense. Don't get me wrong. So the data warehouse and business intelligence look in the past to uh, make sense into the future. They say, this is what happened. And then t based on the information that you know what had happened, uh, you try to make business decisions, the future decisions. Now, big data and analytics is the other way around. Now, big data and analytics, rather than structured data that you get from uh, data warehouses and the business intelligence systems, look into unstructured data. It deals with enormous amounts of data, several terabytes, petabytes amounts of data. It requires a different way of thinking. Now, uh, therefore, big data and cloud go hand in hand. So if you don't know how much data you will be processing, unlike data warehouse or business intelligence, you know how fast your data is growing there. If you don't know how much uh, your 
uh, data is going to grow, how much data you will be processing. If you don't know uh, how much the uh, uh, compute capacity you will require, if you don't know uh, where to store them, uh, at least from a capacity perspective, then uh, there is really not much you can do about it in the traditional sense of IT. Uh, the traditional sense of IT says, you know, I need a server, I'm going to give the server in two, two months. For agility within the business environment, two months is like decades. You have to make a decision today. And uh, so this is where big data and uh, cloud come together. Now, the, uh, I don't want to talk too much about EMC technologies, and I don't want to sound like I'm pitching EMC technology here, but uh, then again, uh, cloud uh, Greenplum is, is a technology you know, that works in the cloud. Okay? So it, uh, it's, part, it's integrated in a private cloud that you will establish. It's uh, fairly flexible. It is a massively uh, parallel processing uh, based on uh, Hadoop technologies, so the significant size of file systems, significant amount of data to be processed. And uh, what we see is that there's a convergence uh, with big, big data and, uh, and cloud, where it's almost like big data technologies become the, uh, the business added value which is not possible to achieve unless you have cloud in place, the first. So this is how we see big data and converging, and this is where we're focusing. And obviously you can't have, it, you can't have any of this unless your data is safe and secure and uh, not, uh, not leaked in any way. Would, would that, uh, does that answer your question? Does it make sense? Okay, thank you. Um, so being conscious, of, do I have more time, or can I take another question? No? Okay, can I, is there any other question? Uh, please. I have a question for your stellar example for your credit card. Sure. Um, 54 days to 4 hours. Yes. Uh, did that involve base availability, high availability? Did you have any sort of disaster recovery between Durham and Austin? Um, the uh, Durham data center is EMC's own data center. North Carolina? Uh, yes. It's EMC's own data center. The credit card is, is one of our customers, but they are two separate engagements. So, uh, I was asking whether you were offering high availability or even disaster recovery. Uh, um, no, we are not a hosting provider. So EM, you know, we do not provide public cloud services to, uh, to, the, you know, to, to the market. This is for our own use, but you know, we're so big enough that uh, you know, we can actually run our own IT as a service organization, and we have multiple companies. But we don't provide third-party uh, DR services. W what you suggest is uh, what we call DR as a service, which uh, service providers uh, provide in the market. So we're working with service providers. So rather than EMC being a service provider, um, now IBM and HP have decided to be service providers themselves. They said they're going to provide compute and DR as a service, as you said. EMC works with service providers or uh, works with companies who want to be service providers. Now, uh, we are working with iQuest in, uh, helping, a in uh, helping a Middle Eastern company to uh, become a service provider. Just exactly you said. A Middle Eastern company, they want to provide disaster recovery as a service, among other things. And uh, we're working with iQuest on actually uh, to get that company achieve their goals. But we don't do it ourselves, no. Okay, am I done? Okay, <laughs> thank you. I can talk on for hours being a consultant, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I'll be around if you get any questions. Thank you.